Hello and welcome back. Thank you for joining me. As someone who has spent many years auditing banks, I'm always following news on the banking industry. I think it is especially important to do it now that things are changing so quickly. Today, I would like to draw your attention to an elephant in the room that not a single bank CEO, not even those who absolutely love to be in the spotlight, such as Jamie Dimon, has addressed. I want to talk to you about billions of dollars in unrealized losses sitting on the bank's books. Now, really quickly, what is an unrealized loss? As the name suggests, it is a loss on an asset that has not been sold or disposed of. In practice, an unrealized loss can be thought of as a paper loss. But once that asset is sold, the loss becomes realized and hits the income statement. When securities are purchased by banks, they're not required to be marked to market or recorded at their market value regularly. They're carried at their purchase price on their books. So effectively, in accounting terms, an unrealized loss is the difference between what the market is willing to pay now for your asset versus what you paid when you bought it. There are some nuances, of course, and some securities are required to be marked to market, but I won't go into those details here in this video. The U.S. banks are currently sitting on billions of dollars worth of unrealized losses. If they were to become realized all at once, our banking system would collapse. There is no doubt about that. According to the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation FDIC quarterly report, unrealized losses on U.S. Treasuries and mortgage-backed securities held by U.S. banks increased by 22% or $126 billion as of the end of the third quarter. As of September the 30th, the latest data available because FDIC publishes this report typically 50 to 60 days after quarter end, the total amount of unrealized losses as of September the 30th is reported to be $684 billion. Imagine what this number would have been if FDIC hadn't taken over SVB, Signature Bank, and First Republic Bank. Those three banks had substantial unrealized losses on their books. By the way, did you know that a smaller bank just collapsed? Heartland Tri-State Bank closed its doors on November the 3rd. Aggressive interest rate hikes by the Fed are likely the main reason why U.S. banks are sitting on billions of dollars worth of unrealized losses. Banks invested in bonds when rates were low, then the Fed hiked rates, which resulted in both types of securities, held to maturity securities as well as available for sale securities, decline in value. Since the total balance of $684 billion is technically unrealized, banks may decide to keep them on their books until securities fully mature, in which case, of course, this issue would completely disappear. However, I would argue that it is an unlikely scenario. There are many banks that cannot afford to hold on to these securities, especially if there is a significant credit event or some type of a downturn and they need to access additional funding. Banks have to be liquid to operate. So to gain that liquidity, a bank would be forced to sell devalued securities at a loss at which point millions or even billions worth of realized losses would hit their bottom line. So far, banks manage to deal with unrealized losses thanks to being able to borrow from the Fed's program called Bank Term Funding Program. Effectively, it is a short-term bailout program that the bank provides. Banks get an opportunity to borrow money using their securities that lost value and would cause substantial losses when sold. This program is kind of like a band-aid. It doesn't really solve any issues. It doesn't solve any problems, but it does allow several options. And let's be honest, it just buys time. Besides surging unrealized losses, the latest FDIC data shows important key facts about the state of the U.S. banking system. For those of you who are curious and interested, I would like to go ahead and share the highlights. I personally think that this is quite important to be aware of, so let's take a look. The first thing the FDIC is telling us 
net income decreased from the prior quarter, driven by lower non-interest income and higher realized losses on securities. You may recall that right after the third quarter ended, mainstream media was trying to hype up banks' performance, saying that their earnings increased as the result of higher interest rates without actually taking the time to either understand or explain what is happening in reality. Community banks reported lower net income from the prior quarter. There is quite a bit of concern related to the smaller banks, small to mid-sized banks, and their ability to manage what's going on with interest rates, what's going on with their real estate portfolios, and the economy in general. So I'm sure that we will hear a lot more about community banks not being able to manage. Total deposits declined for a sixth consecutive quarter, FDIC is reporting. With respect to the decline in income, here's what FDIC is saying. Net income decreased from the prior quarter driven by lower non-interest income and higher realized losses on securities. Third quarter net income for the 4,614 FDIC-insured commercial banks and savings institutions declined by $2.4 billion from the prior quarter to $68.4 billion. Lower non-interest income and higher realized losses on securities drove the decline in net income from the previous quarter. FDIC just mentioned higher realized losses on securities driving the drop in net income. We will likely see this more frequently when small to mid-sized banks need to access additional liquidity and are forced to sell their undervalued securities at a loss. Needless to say that if the Fed does decide to increase rates again, these unrealized losses will only continue to grow. The longer the Fed keeps rates high, the longer the banks will have to use Fed's bailout program by borrowing against their devalued assets. Now, the sponsor of this video is ExpressVPN. You're very well familiar with the company. It offers best-in-class encryption that keeps your internet traffic protected from hackers and from snoops. ExpressVPN uses industry's most advanced VPN server and it gives you control over your online privacy and how your data is being used. As you connect to a secure VPN server, your internet actually goes through an encrypted tunnel that nobody can see into, including hackers, including governments, and even your internet service provider. ExpressVPN allows you to connect five devices simultaneously with just one subscription. Go ahead and claim three full months of completely free service when you sign up with the link that I'm sharing in the description below. I personally use ExpressVPN every single day, and I'm very pleased with the quality of the service and the product itself. As always, thank you very much for joining me. Thank you for watching. Please give this video a like, share, and subscribe on Rumble and YouTube. I would love to have you back for my next video tomorrow. And if you enjoy reading, find me on Substack. I'll see you in my new one tomorrow. Bye for now.